Welcome to the Content Amplified Podcast, brought to you by Masset. Our goal is to help you get more from your marketing content. Each episode is a 10 to 15 minute interview with industry experts that share amazing insights to help you squeeze as much juice from your content as you possibly can. Here's today's interview. Welcome back to another episode of Content Amplified. Today, I'm joined by Brian. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ben. Brian, you have a fascinating background. So different from me. Um, I love it. Could you maybe introduce yourself and introduce your background about how you got into marketing and kind of your passions for marketing? I think it's super valuable. And then we'll dive into the subject for today. Yeah, uh, I am uh, B, Brian Santa Maria, and I am currently working with VC Held CPG Company, leading their marketing and creative efforts and, and going through a sort of rebrand in the go to market strategy. I also freelance with a handful of companies that have asked me to do similar things, build their creative departments and fill their creative strategies out for, for their go to market strategies. And they'll range anywhere from no money to two, three, four hundred million in, in market cap. So bottom mid size. I started, though, in theater. I went to art school, uh, Cal Arts, wonderful school. I wish there was a mascot that I could say, go Bulls or something, but they have no mascot. Um, I was going to be an animator, and that's Walt Disney School. It's multidisciplinary. So when I came out with my theater degree, it was very avant-garde based. I got to work with some incredible artists while I was there, Michael Counts, Richard Foreman, Travis Preston. And going through that sort of unconventional theater space, you wear a lot of different hats and and, and you, you no longer sort of have these lines around what is and isn't theater or what is and isn't music or what is and isn't whatever art medium you want. It all sort of feels like as you and I briefly talked about before this this uh, podcast, is you feel like you've given yourself a lot of tools and they're all at your disposal to use and whoever's going to label it is going to label it. And so um, after that, I ended up in uh, doing a lot of classical theater. I was at Shakespeare Theater in DC under Michael Kahn. I had done a stint with Disney Imagineering through an arts group that I had worked with out in uh, out of CalArts. And then I was at UCB in New York while Amy Amy Buller was still there and and then writing for The Onion. And so when I came onto The Onion, The Onion was transitioning from the newspaper and the website to video. Uh, and it started as two to three minute short videos uh, to rival, to satirize, I guess, you know, headline news and that sort of thing. And we we quickly, if this, then what, and started doing various forms of news, sports news, reviews, breaking news, whatever. And that went on to two television shows, it won a Peabody, and then I got sick. And so through my medical treatments, when I was back in Omaha, having to leave New York, uh, was the first time I ever worked at an ad agency. And they, they had heard I was in town and, and brought me in to punch up for Disney. Anyone who's worked in comedy knows what the word punch up means. And um, we sold some stuff to Disney really fast. And they said, well, you come in and do this for us a lot. And that's, that was that. And so I came in as a uh, junior copywriter and then eventually quickly copywriter at Bailey Lowerman. That went on to some freelance work when I decided to come back out to LA. And the freelance work turned into head writer at Something Massive, which became head of content at Something Massive as we built a content studio in the floor beneath us. And then got brought into a big retailer, Best Buy, to modernize their digital work that went very quickly and eventually we in-housed everything. So the work that had been done by CPB and Gray now became an in-house agency at Best Buy. And then the past year, 18 months, has been what I opened talking about, which has been me working with some CPG brands and after having built an internal studio with an agency and an internal agency with a corporation, companies asking, how do we approach the creative work and the, and the marketing work really internally? I don't know who, you, who you, whether you normally talk to creatives or marketers or or both. There's certainly a lot of overlap between the two. And now I've found myself doing filling that overlap too. Is that um, I went back to school in in the middle there after Cal Arts and I did uh, Stanford lead at their GSB and then I did an MBA at Brown and really sort of bridged that void between creative strategy and creative execution and am able to sort of understand what it's all about um, because for me. The connective tissue between the beginning of my career and hopefully the middle where I am now has been that it, it was always focused on what it's about. All of these things I can do and have done are the tool set that I use to elevate the about, whether it was a, a, a three-minute comedic thing, satirized thing on 
The Onion or whether it was an, an avant-garde theater production in college or whether it's selling refrigerators on Labor Day at Best Buy, it was always being able to identify, okay, what is it? What is this about? Which hopefully is the top of your brief. And then say, these are all of our tools we can use. Which ones work the best to, to do that? That's fantastic. So let's put yourself in the shoes of someone, you know, coming into a brand new business. And it sounds like you have been in this position a lot. You're, you're coming into a business that is clearly wanting to level up their creative, their storytelling, their content. Where do you start in analyzing where you're at and figure out a pathway to where they could be? I mean, you're talking about buying entire floors and creating content studios. It has to start somewhere. How do you go from that humble beginnings to something that incredible, bringing all this effort in-house for Best Buy? How does that scale? What does that process look like? What, what's the framework you use? Again, this is the, where that bridge is between strategy and creative execution. It's being able to identify what you need and, and what the difference is between what you need and what you want and what the customer actually needs. And understanding what your tool set is and not living in a fantasy world. I think that you work with large agencies. There's a problem in the advertising world where we only give lions and big creative awards to these people who do big, expensive things that um, are almost built for the applause, right? The metrics on whether or not they converted are irrelevant. But but it's it's almost like we're only ready to give those people accolades. And what we don't do is look at these small brands and these small hustlers who are out there working for people who don't have huge budgets. And because they don't have huge budgets and huge resources, they have to temper what the expectations are on the work. A client that I would come in that I have come in for is working with virtually zero budgets, but the brand that exists there is um, also inadequate. And so, how do we take the brand, repackage it without starting over because we don't have the timelines to start over? So you've got to you've got to patch the ship up while it's sailing, but not put yourself behind any eight ball by setting expectations that you can't meet. And so that starts with identifying what your tool set is. Our tool set is going to be stock photography or, or stock assets. We can't use anything other than stock assets. So that means that if we build a mood board that is using Chanel photography, well, we're setting ourselves up to fail because we can't do that right? So we have to build a mood board out of what is actually accessible to us. And it, I think it really starts there is finding somewhere that you can work with, knowing what your limitations are going to be, and then working within those limitations. We say all the time, think outside the box. And there's not enough emphasis and reward given to people who think inside the box, that those box limitations, if they're the correct limitations, if you've identified the correct limitations, then what they are doing is keeping you from swimming out of your depth. And if you work within them and still stay focused on what it is you're about, which should be primary always, 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 no matter what the work is, is what are you about and how are you then, what communication medium are you using to communicate that? Then you can make work that really works at any level. How do you help a business understand what they are about? You know, some know it, some don't. How would you recommend that you figure that out? You got to be a company that wants to know it. If you don't want to know it, then you're never going to figure it out. And that you see that all the time in even large successful companies, right? Like not knowing what you're about doesn't mean you can't be financially successful. People do it all the time. They distract themselves or, or whatever, and something is still working. Uh, mm -hmm. Success validates bad decisions all the time. But um, I would say that what I do and what, I've, what I'm doing with somebody right now is I start with the new employees. What did you think this company was before you came in? What do you think it is now? Then go to the old employees. What do you think this company is about? And then you go to their customers if you can. What are they giving you? And why do you keep coming back to them? Then what do you think they're about? And then what I do is I sort of look at where the alignment is, where they're misaligned. And then usually there are some interesting reveals that surprise me along the way. And so, oh, that's an interesting tidbit. That's an interesting tidbit. That's an interesting tidbit. And then we get down to the core, right? They call them, there's an old uh, teacher at Stanford who used to talk about the five whys. And when you're interviewing people, you always want to be asking them dumb questions. And they'll say, why do you know, why'd you go, why do you go to McDonald's? Well, because I'm hungry. Why? Why are you hungry? Well, because I'd like to have breakfast. Why? Well, because I have a long day ahead of me. Why? Because I work really hard and I'm up late doing work. And so I have to get up early in the morning on an empty stomach. Okay. Now what started as a bunch of stupid questions have told us, has told us an awful lot about 
actually what product, what an Egg McMuffin <laughs> is doing for a consumer in that morning, right? It's more than just I'm hungry. It's that, uh, and I don't know, I made up those answers, so maybe that's not at all what an Egg McMuffin does for somebody in the morning. But I, you, you get what I'm saying, is that you're serving a commuter's need to stay focused on their work without being distracted by a loss of energy or something like that. That's a much more narrow focus than, than I'm hungry. And so, and so figuring out how to do that from inside the company with old people, inside the company with new people, inside the company, or and then outside the company from the people who work with them, gives me a lot of information around what it is they're about. And then circle that. And then for me as a writer, because I'm a writer at my core, is we write it all out. And then I take out everything that's unnecessary everything that's unnecessary, everything that's unnecessary until you get the simplest, till you distill it to its simplest form. At Best Buy, what we were able to end up with is let's talk about what's possible. And there's a lot baked into that line. Talk comes from a learning that one of the things people come to Best Buy for is conversation. That uh, why do they come to us when you like, again, five whys. Why did you come to us? Well, because I need a refrigerator. Yeah, but why did you come to us? Well, because I could come in and talk to somebody about it. What, what did you want to talk about? Why did you want to talk to somebody about it? Because I didn't know what refrigerators could do. And so now all of a sudden we get a lot deeper about what, it, what purpose it is we're serving. We're actually serving the conversation part of someone's fulfilled possibilities. And so we say, let's talk about what's possible. That's done well for us. And then when, when I talk about distilling it, you can look at a company like Coke. Of course, it's easy to look at a company like Apple or Coke or Nike and say, do what they're doing. But, um, but in this case, Coke on every bottle for a hundred and some odd years has had the word enjoy on it, right? How much more distilled can you get than what Coke does for you? Enjoy. Now you look at it, you look at every advertisement on Coke and in some way they're, they're celebrating enjoyment, you know? Yeah, I love that. That makes a lot of sense. So one final question, cause we're coming towards the end. I told you it would go by really, really quickly. When you're digging deep, do you tell the different layers of why? So like, you know, in your McDonald's example, you know, why did you come to McDonald's and you started asking why's, do you typically only focus on like the bottom insight why's, or is there an advantage or a time where you would share the why's at every layer? How do you kind of weigh out when you have found the about, you know, what you're about through the why's? Yeah, I think what you're looking for when you do that is, oh, it's a sort of a business term, so insight. You're looking for, when, when you keep asking questions like that, what you're hoping to get is on at one point, you want to get to the bottom and distill it down, but you also somewhere along the way are hoping to reveal an insight, in quotes. And, and insight can come in many different forms, but ultimately what it is, it's that moment that makes you go, oh, that's a little bit surprising, but at the same time, no, I feel like I knew it and just never put my finger on it. And no one else in the market is actually addressing that thing right there. And I can speak to somebody in that way. You know, okay, here's here's an insight. Is one of the brands uh, I work with, we sell, they sell coffee, we sell coffee to churches. And in interviewing people and figuring out what it is we do, what are you actually buying? Well, we're buying coffee. Why? Because we want people to feel like they are at home. Why? Because we want them to stay. Why? Because we want them to, we want to build community. Oh, what we're actually doing is building community here. So now we start serving, we start serving community. This brand starts addressing the needs of the church community, uh, not just the needs of coffee right? Because they can, there's a thousand coffees out there. They can shop for the most flavorful one if they want. But we start addressing the needs of the community, which may be very different. And then what happens is three or four months later, what we find is once we've started doing that, all of a sudden these churches that had been subscribers of the coffee are ordering 60 to 70% more coffee. Why are they ordering 60 to 70% more coffee? Uh, not because they have way more people coming to church, but because the people who are there are staying and talking longer. Why? Because the community has been strengthened. And so we've ide we identified an insight in the need, addressed it through the brand, and answered for what the church was actually purchasing from us in the first place, whether they knew it or not, which was community, strengthening community. And that was never the target. That was never the target, right? We were never, we didn't come at it trying, we didn't know that was the bottom when they said it, but we just identified the insight and answered for it. Yeah, exactly. Well, I feel like we could go on for days, but uh, unfortunately we've come to the end of our time. Brian, if anyone wants to connect with you online, how can they get in touch with you and further the conversation? I guess LinkedIn, be Santa Maria on LinkedIn. I'm not on Facebook anymore. Um, I am not on 
I mean, I have a Twitter account at Brian Santa Maria, but I, I, I don't think I use it ever any, any longer, uh, since the, uh, since the great upheaval and my email, you can, you can email me at be Santa Maria senior at gmail.com. I'll answer that. Oh, and Brian at Santa Maria creative.com Santa Maria creative.com. You can, that'll get right to me. Awesome. And we'll link to everything in the show notes. So again, thank you for the time. These insights are amazing. Appreciate your time. Love it, Ben. Thank you so much for having me. What a, what a great way to spend my afternoon. Thank you for listening to the Content Amplified Podcast. Please subscribe and leave us a review. And for additional ways to get more out of your content, visit our website at getmasset.com. That's getmasset.com. And tune in next time to the Content Amplified Podcast.